excellent. God has been good. All right. Let's turn uh, to Acts chapter number nine. This is our lectionary passage for this day. And, you know, uh, I certainly found both of these passages, all of these passages this week as I was reading through them, so inspirational. You know, there was uh, another passage in John chapter 20 for the lectionary that uh, I, I was uh, really feeling called and, and led to preach from that talked about uh, how Peter, who was uh, one of the ones that uh, forsook Jesus, you know, d denied Jesus three times, and, and Peter was not able to live up to the, the, the call or the commitment that was in his heart. And because of his inability to live up to that commitment and not deny Jesus, Peter ended up uh, being one of those folks who was very much, I think, living out a lot of shame and disappointment. And so Jesus shows up in one of these post-resurrection appearances and, 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 and restores Peter and gives Peter a reminder that you won't be defined by the worst thing you've done in your life. And, uh, and for Peter, denying Jesus was, was a pretty low point. But Jesus restores Peter and tells him to feed my sheep and my lambs and tend to those precious, precious, vulnerable ones that I leave in your charge. And, and so I was going to preach about that. And then uh, I, 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 I was over here in this book of uh, the early church, uh, book of Acts, and, and uh, love this passage of scripture about Saul. Another one of these post-resurrection encounters. And so I landed on this passage, but the theme is still the same, that after resurrection experiences and moments that God will continue to show up and give you many, many more experiences to help you clarify what you experienced previously. That God is not a one-off God. That makes sense? Like, you know, some, some folk feel like, you know, I had this great experience with God and then I don't have to have any more experiences or I had this great revelation. I don't have any more revelations or even I had this encounter with God and I got it all right the first time. As a matter of fact, one of the great blessings, I believe, of the post-resurrection experiences of the early church followers and disciples is that Jesus kept showing up. The Holy Spirit kept showing up as many times as necessary to help clarify the very limited vision of the faithful or those striving to be faithful. And I want you to know today that uh, God's going to keep showing up in our lives to make sure that we're getting all the clarity we need. Because even in our greatest spiritual ecstasies, uh, you can still only get a glimpse of God's greatness. And you need another, another, another one of those touches. Just pat yourself on the chest and say, give me one more touch, God. Give me one more touch. That's one of those good old Pentecost sayings. Just one more touch. All right. But that's not what we're preaching about. That's just why I decided on this passage. Amen. Acts chapter number nine, verse number one. This is Saul. His name will soon be changed to Paul. Uh, and it is thought that uh, this is the conversion experience of Saul, who would soon be Paul, who uh, either uh, wrote, contributed to, or inspired uh, through his teachings and discipleship at least a third or half of the epistles, the letters of the Christian New Testament that we draw much of our theological kind of sources and soil from. And so very important journey of this, this wonderful, wonderful, complex a human being that God used in spite of all of his internalized challenges. And um, hope you see yourself in this passage, uh, because I sure do. Amen. Meanwhile, Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus. So that if he found any who belong to the way, mm, how, how convenient, amen, uh, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. So just a little quick background, you know, uh, this is the immediate aftermath of the killing of Jesus, the murder of Jesus, the execution of Jesus. And of course, we see that uh, there are those that are still trying to snuff out this emerging 
uh, kind of movement or followers of Jesus or followers of the way, as they were called. And there were some who were worried about the Roman Empire's kind of uh, uh, focusing on this seemingly uprising, this rebellion, and the religious leaders of the day were trying to figure out how can we make sure that this rebellion does not get out of hand. Because the last thing we want is um, the rest of our, our comrades and, and our country folk to be under extreme persecution because of this small little sect. Now, again, I spoke about this last week, about how we must always uh, push back against any reading that would attempt or inadvertently seek to uh, drive anti-Semitism or hatred of Jewish folk. And sometimes our texts, when not read well and certainly interpreted and preached well, uh, folks who are quite either deranged or, or just addicted to violence can take a biblical text and, and, and make, it, make them do all kind of stuff, amen. Amen, but how many know that Jewish folk are not our enemy, amen. Amen, they are folk created in the image, image of God just like you and me. And so, uh, so we should not read these, these texts in a way that, that, that drive anti-Semitism. And yet, as we continue to read, we see verse number three. So as Saul was going along and approaching Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. And Saul fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Saul asked, who are you, Lord? And the reply came, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with Saul stood speechless because they heard the voice but saw no one. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. Mm, though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. Hey Amen. I, I, I didn't catch that last, la, this last week, but though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. Man, that's, that's another sermon for another day. Amen. Well, some of y'all already got your message for today. Amen. <laughs> I know I just got mine. Amen. And Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand, brought him into Damascus. For three days he was without sight, and neither ate nor drank. It's the word of God for us, the people of God. Let us say thanks be to God. So today's message, a familiar title maybe for some of you that have been around the way for quite some time, but I'm going to preach on the topic, Divine Interruptions. Amen. Divine Interruptions. God bless the word of God that has been read for us, the people of God. We ask you to hide this word in our hearts so we won't sin against you and allow the spirit of God that makes preaching and teaching easy. May it rest upon you, me, and all who hear this word today. And we'll say thank you, God. In Jesus' name, we pray. Let the people of the Lord say amen. 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 Pat yourself on the chest. Say, I need to be interrupted. Amen. Now, you know, uh, this, this week has continued to uh, offer us all kinds of roller coaster moments that, uh, depending on how you're situated in the world, uh, may cause you to reflect on the fragility of life, the fragility of our existence. Uh, I was uh, so hurt when I uh, heard about the death of Rachel Held Evans, who is a, a, a comrade, friend. We got a chance to meet while we were serving together on the Obama Faith Based Advisory Council. She was a, a wonderful, wonderful, courageous woman uh, out of the evangelical church tradition who uh, spent much of her uh, last at least decade or so um, pushing back against just some of the most terrible expressions of Christian faith in America. And uh, she um, was a wonderful, wonderful sister who um, got ill in a very sudden manner and her body was not able to recover and she ended up uh, transitioning into glory on late 
Friday night, early Saturday morning, and uh, leaves her husband and some children um, in in her in her uh, wake. And and so, you know, I I continue to 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 be reminded about the preciousness of life, and I think all of us can attest to that. Uh, another one of uh, my mentors, Dr. Leonard Lovett, passed away a couple of weeks ago unexpectedly, and he was one of the first uh, uh, theologians in the Pentecostal church tradition, at least in the Church of God in Christ, who really was attempting to, to fuse or remind us of the necessity of a faithful way of practicing Pentecostal spirituality in a, in a way that honors our intellect and the call for justice, and he he transitioned in. And then, of course, you know, I was speaking at this, this event uh, at the Levi's um, uh, Corporation. I was meeting with their board, and I was talking. They were asking me, so, you know, uh, you know, what gives you hope in this season? And I said, well, you know, I wish I did not watch the Senate hearing with uh, Barr this week, because after watching that, I felt like expatriating. Amen. I felt like just taking my family and go, go on this 400th year, amen, of the anniversary of, of black folk being in this country and just going back to Ghana or Senegal or somewhere, just go find some roots somewhere. Because it's obvious to me that we are living in a country that has made a mockery. Amen. I mean, it's always kind of been a mockery for some of us, but I mean, now they are celebrating and, 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 and continuing to amplify the ways in which the quote-unquote powerful and wealthy and elite and privileged uh, just, just, just are comfortable amplifying lies and using their power to, 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 to spread death and despair. And, and, and all of this happening literally in the kind of aftermath of Easter and Resurrection weekend. And it just goes to remind me and hopefully it reminds you that one of the great reasons why we need resurrection to be a daily reality is because trouble does not end uh, without, uh, you know, kind of uh, some revisitation, if you will. Amen. Trouble don't last always, but trouble is persistent. <laughs> Do I have an honest church up in here today? Amen. Now, we're going to get a reprieve. Amen. But, but there are things happening around us and in our lives that remind us that a miracle, God's radical interruption is necessary. It's necessary. Uh, you know, uh, th this is a, a, a often a, a question that some folk historically use theodicies to try and, and, and give language to why do good things happen to bad people. And, 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 and you know, uh, I, I often remember I asked God these questions, and God, you know, just kind of remind me that I'm not that good myself. Amen. So I should just be, be, be careful about asking God, why me? Amen. <laughs> uh -huh. because we, how many know we good in our own eyes pretty much all the time? I got an honest church up in here today, man. I mean, I know when we compare ourselves to other people, we good. We're like, oh, I, I'm not like them. Surely. I mean, it, why me? Amen. And then, you know, if we all get into a comparison game, uh, then we can fall into a deadly game of relativity and realize that all of us have not only sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, but all of us are in need of a savior. All of us are in need of redemption. All of us in need of a resurrection. Amen. And God saved me from a church or from a people that get so good that they don't believe they need a resurrection. Amen. Mm -hmm. and, and so some of these questions, you know, about why do bad things happen, you know, I, I, I often get in these kind of kind of mental conversations. God, why don't you just stop the wars? Why, don't, why do you allow injustice to reign? Why don't you protect the weak, the innocent, and the helpless? Why don't you just make everything all right? And, and, and I often hear God, you know, uh, just reminding me that uh, that's why I have the church here. Amen. Amen. That's why I am attempting to continue to uh, compel followers of the way to be much more 
uh, committed to the stewardship of creation. Uh, many of you may have had a chance to, to take a quick glance at uh, the episode we did last week with Kamau Bell on, on the CNN show. And, and, and it was, thank you, it was, it was a very um, interesting kind of dichotomy around how we can often uh, participate in the life of church or religion and, or, or faith and, and become the very opposite of the way of Jesus. Amen. Man, you know, you, you kind of just, you know, wonder, amen, is, is, is the way of Jesus the problem? Man, I don't think so. Amen. So if it's not the way of Jesus, maybe it's my way and our way. And, 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 and I think one of the most important expressions of God's love to humanity is to interrupt us when our way is not aligning with the way of Jesus. Amen. And quiet as it's kept, we'll spend our whole life trying to get into complete alignment with the way of Jesus. In, the, in, the, in, in, in one of our theological traditions, uh, Methodism, there's this kind of uh, a lifelong uh, uh, part of spiritual formation called sanctification, where, you know, justification is when, you know, you are, are, are saved once because God justifies you through the work of Jesus on the cross. Glorification is when you are saved in the end through the, the, the parousia, the second coming of, of Jesus, and, and it comes and to take God's people uh, to be in eternal fellowship. But sanctification is a lifelong process. Of you and I being sanctified. Mm -hmm. I grew up in a sanctified church. Amen. You know, but it, you know, what I thought about sanctification is like you got to pray and, and tarry at the altar. Thank you, Jesus. 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 Thank you. And you just kept saying, thank you, Jesus, because you was thankful. <laughs> Amen. I mean, you just kept saying, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And, and we just tarried. It was called a tarrying service. Y'all don't know about no tarrying service up here at the way. Man, we a little too new jack for a tarrying service. But it may be time for all night prayer service. Amen. Sister Pastor Tanisha going to help us get that going. But sanctification was not just something that happened to you one time. Sanctification is a lifelong process. Why? Because you and I can get so used to a rhythm of life that we take for granted. God's willingness to redirect us, our thinking, our priorities, our, our sensibilities, our, our, our assumptions. And so in this text, I think it is so important for you and I to see that there is a blessing in divine interruptions. Just like I interrupt my child when uh, they are uh, getting too full of themselves. Amen. When, they're, when they say the curiosity kills the cat, as they say. And so my job is to interrupt them before the cat gets killed. Somebody say amen, right? And they may not like it, amen. But as I told one of them, I, I, I quoted my father to them. My dad used to tell me this all the time, amen. I'm not worried about your crying. Your tears don't mean anything to me. And my dad, he's just a very, very troubled man. <laughs> amen. No, no, no. My dad was the bomb dad, most bomb dad in the history of the world, amen. Because he understood that there was a way that seemed right to me. But the end was destruction. I couldn't see destruction coming because I hadn't lived long enough. And can you imagine the kind of love that God displays, the eternal God, the God that's been here before 
time existed before you came around. This God loves you and I enough to interrupt us and help us get back on the right track. God will interrupt you and help you learn things that you didn't even know you needed to learn. Uh, so, so, so I, I this I don't have that much time. So, 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 so appreciate, child of God, that the interruptions that come from God are intended to make sure that you don't waste your whole life going in the wrong direction. Yeah, I mean, no, with 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 death being something that visits us more than we want. We don't have time to waste in this life to be going in the wrong direction. Amen. God help me to be be interrupted and 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 put back in the stream of your will for my life. And even Lord when I I don't appreciate it and the tears start flowing. Oh, don't, don't let the, these tears. I wish I could talk to somebody today. So one of the first things that I find in this story with Saul that is worth us thinking about, again, Saul was persecuting and killing the followers of Jesus. And Saul, a very zealous Jew, the scripture says, uh, zealous, someone filled with zeal and ambition and passion, Saul was looking for warrants. Saul was a hitman. Mm, Saul was one of these, uh, you know, these paid folk who, who would go out here and do all kind of kind of violent things in the name of God. And it just reminds me that God don't need our help to do violence in his name. If Jesus, amen, Jesus modeled for us, we're talking about the way of Jesus, right? Jesus, when, when he was being interviewed by Pilate, uh, Jesus said, I am the, 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 the uh, or Pilate says, I hear you a king. And Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world. And, and, and Jesus said, now be clear, though, if I wanted to, I got a squad that is waiting. I mean, they, 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 they. They, 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 they like, you just say the word, Jesus, and we, we, we can, we can clean all this lightweight up. Somebody say amen. But Jesus, with all of his power, decided not to use violence. And yet Saul, a learned person, a privileged person, a person with all kind of power over people forsook the way of Jesus and was using violence to kill folk who had a different ideology, a different theology, a different religion, a different... And in his mind, he was doing the right thing. Saul is a very cautionary tale for every one of us, whether you are a Christ follower or not, because Saul teaches, first point, that our personal zeal does not always align with the right things. You and I can have personal zeal. I am fired up about this thing. Oh, this is my passion. I wake up every day and I'm concerned about this and, and I'm concerned about injustice. I'm concerned about, 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 about the ex exploitation of the poor. I'm concerned about my children. I'm concerned about my relationship. I'm concerned about my academics. I'm concerned about my vocation. I'm concerned about all these things, but you must always question. How does your passion align with God's purpose? We're going to launch a series about gifts real soon, and this is just a little prelude to some of us who have lots of gifts, but are our gifts aligned with the way of Jesus? Because we, man, never believe, well, never may be too definitive of a word, but we rarely that's a good word. 
believe that our way is not the best way. That's okay, yeah, man. Because like, who wants to just be so like, like you know, uh, 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 Lord, my brain just ain't working today, yeah, man. Who 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 wants to be so so insecure or 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 unclear about your own decision making process? Where I'm just don't, I don't know, I don't trust what I think, I don't trust what I believe. No one's asking you to live your life in that way, but we always should be asking ourselves, does my zeal and my passion for this thing meet the way of Jesus? Does it create more love, joy, peace, hope, healing, help? And does my way require me to be violent in order for it to happen? There's a whole lot of ways to be violent without you having to pull a gun. Amen. How about the ways in which we use our mouths? Amen. I'm, I'm one of these folk, amen. I was in a meeting this week, and, and I, I, I lost control in the meeting. I was just, you know, just speaking loudly. Praise God. And 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 I just got away from myself. So much so that I didn't even show up to the meeting the next day because I said I need to get myself back together. <laughs> you ever had one of them days, hey amen? It's like I need to do a call-in sick day, or everybody gonna be sick. I may be unemployed, uh, you know, but I'm gonna be walking out this job feeling good for about 12 hours. Till I realized I got a mortgage and things. I'd be like, man, how come my personal zeal, my passion got the best of me? Some of our passions get the best of us because we have not spent the time to interrogate what drives our passion for the wrong or right things. Man, all of this violence out here in the world is because people are zealous perhaps for Something that may be good, but it is not right for you to go about it this way. Saul, give Saul the benefit of the doubt, he was a hit man. Guess we need hit mans, I guess, I don't know. Because it seemed like folk were willing to employ him. And you know, how many know our tax dollars employs a lot of Hit folk. Hitters, you know, in the streets we call them hitters, you know. Folk who out here and they, they, they are skilled at taking people's lives. And so we can get all, you know, uppity if we want to. Oh, that's just so, 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 so uh, ancient and so, so uncivilized. But we arguably have one of the greatest well-funded military apparatus in the history of the world. And most folk claim they follow the way of Jesus. I'm not hating on nobody. I'm just trying to tell you now that all of us, somebody say all of us, all of us have to check our zeal, check our passions. And does it align with the ways of Jesus? Uh, first, first question then, I think I've probably said it a few times already, uh, but, but let me just clarify it. Uh, are you passionate for the wrong things? And how do you ensure your zeal for whatever your zeal is for? How do you ensure it creates life and not death? Man, to pull my friend in her, uh, in memory and, and pull her into my sermon, uh, Rachel says, death is something empires worry about not something gardeners worry about. Death is certainly not something resurrection people worry about. And so if you and I have zeal and passion, we must ensure that the passions we have are not instruments preoccupied with the death, the hurting, the maiming, the laming of people we may not agree with. You don't have to agree with people in order to preserve their life. Hello, somebody. And I, I worry that 
in our in our desire to be right, we resort to too much death dealing. This is one of the reasons why our churches have to continue to wrestle with what does it mean to be much more inclusive of people who we may not fully understand or agree with. Not subjecting their humanity to our litmus test of agreement. And the church ain't, we, we don't got a good resume for these kind of things. I mean, there's a whole lot of folk, queer folk, immigrant folk, un, undocumented folk, uh, folk with criminal records, all kind of folk that we figure out a way to marginalize because we, they, we uncomfortable. But your discomfort should not be the cause of someone else's death. Hello, somebody. So Saul is a teachable, teachable person in this regard. Zealous, but zealous for the wrong thing. Second thing and, and, and that, that, that I'll lift up as we prepare to transition to communion is that divine interruptions lead to spiritual recalibration. When God interrupts you and I, it should trigger some kind of transformation that gets you better aligned and calibrated with the purposes of God. God's interruption does not intend to leave you the same. God wants to interrupt you and I and make sure we are put back on the right track. God's interruption is always uh, 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 accompanied by a introduction, a reintroduction. Anybody ever had to be reintroduced to somebody? Amen. Because you just kind of, you know, I think I met you before, but but you know, I, either I don't remember your name or you don't remember your face. Amen. I, I'm I'm one of them kind of people. Amen. I got so many faces in my head. Your name often eludes me. And then sometimes I may know your name and be like, oh, yeah, you did something different with your hair. It's like, no, no, it's been like this my whole life. <laughs> like, my bad. Sorry about that. So sometimes divine interruptions require, listen, a reintroduction to Jesus. Because some of us have made Jesus in our own image or in the image of who we like or who we admire we turn Jesus into Donald Trump. We turn Jesus into Barack Obama. We turn Jesus into your favorite professor. You turn Jesus into yourself. And you need a radical interruption because you begin to realize that the Jesus that I have turned into whoever is not the Jesus I need to put my life's hands or my life in his hands. So Jesus often gives you an introduction, and I love it how Jesus does it to Saul because Saul on his way to doing the wrong thing. I love it how Jesus didn't wait for Saul to mess up. Amen. Jesus was like, let me interrupt you, Saul, on your way. Anybody ever been interrupted on your way? Amen. Or while you was in the act of. It's like, oh, my goodness. I, I was waiting to just pray for some forgiveness. She's like, no, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm going to interrupt you right along the way. Why are you in the midst of cussing somebody out? Why are you in the midst of your fighting? Why are you in the midst of, of your complaining? Why are you in the midst of, of, of your unfaithfulness? I'm getting ready to interrupt you right now. I remember listening to DJ Hughley. Like, man, he was talking about how the whinings, you know, they, that's when they cross over. Gospel artists were first starting to cross over. Amen. And he was like, you know, I hate listening to BB and CC. Amen. Because, you know, I be doing my thing and all of a sudden BB and CC whining. Some of y'all don't know nothing about no BB and CC whining. But they sing these, these, these songs that, that, that could, they could sound it like a love song, but they actually a song about Jesus. So they in there in the middle of their stuff, and all of a sudden, you know, you broke in my heart, turned me the right way, Jesus. And I was like, oh, snap. Uh, in the middle of my mess, you interrupted me. How many of y'all been interrupted? You was interrupted at the club. You was interrupted in the smokehouse. You was interrupted in the fight. You've been interrupted. Why? Because Jesus did not want you to go down that way and hurt yourself. 
So Jesus said, I'm getting ready to interrupt you right here because you can't take the final conclusion of this matter. And I want you to know, child of God, that there is an interruption that God is trying to bring to all of us today. Our world is is tinkering and 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 on the on the brink of a of a global disaster there are ways god are trying to interrupt us around our care for the earth that this earth is 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 getting ready because of climate disaster to be uninhabitable for millions and billions of people and yet some of us are just moving along as if it does not matter somebody say interrupt us god Some of us are in the church and we are just continuing to move on as if the church is not in trouble. But I hear Jesus saying to Saul, uh, who are you? Jesus says that I am Jesus. Uh, And it's so great because you got to have a little history to appreciate why Jesus interrupted Saul the way that he did. You got to realize that Saul was a Jew and he was very familiar with God's self-revelation in the Old Testament to Moses. Uh, And when Moses was in the wilderness holding uh himself uh, uh, uh and 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 hiding and 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 trying to separate himself from the acts he did in the house of pharaoh god came and met moses and gave him a divine interruption and moses was introduced to god by god uh, through the words that i am that I am. And so here you have Saul thousands of years later uh, sitting in a Damascus Road experience. uh, And Jesus gives him the same introduction. Uh, Saul says, who are you, Jesus? Uh, And Jesus says, I am Jesus. Uh, Isn't it a blessing that Jesus can come and find you wherever you are? Uh, And when he begins to introduce himself, uh, he'll give you an introduction that you are very familiar with Uh, he'll help you to realize that i'm gonna find you on the wrong road Uh, i'm gonna find you in the right road Uh, i'm gonna find you when your heart is hurting Uh, i'm gonna find you in your joys and in your pleasures Uh, i'm gonna find you in your questions Uh, i'm gonna find you in your answers Uh, i'm gonna find you in the club Uh, i'm gonna find you at the party Uh, i'm gonna to find you in jail or in church Uh, somebody holler find me jesus i'm gonna find you in your universities Uh, i'm gonna find you in your marriage Uh, i'm gonna find you when you're broke Uh, and i'm gonna find you when you're rich Uh, it does not matter uh, what stage of life you're in Uh, i want you to know child of god uh, that when resurrection season comes uh, he's gonna find you uh, wherever you are Uh, and when he finds you uh, i just want you to say here i I am Lord uh, speak to me uh, because I need to hear a word from you uh, Jesus says I am Jesus uh, the one you are persecuting uh, you may be in a troubled situation uh, Jesus will say I am your Jehovah Jireh uh, because I deliver you every time uh, you may find yourself in a situation of sickness uh, and Jesus will say I am your Jehovah Rapha uh, because I am the one that heals you. You may find yourself in a situation where you won't see no way out. And Jesus will say, I am your bridge over troubled water. Wherever you are, I want you to know that Jesus will find you and he'll give you a new introduction that will recalibrate the way you think about things today. I want you to be open to a recalibration Uh, change my eyes uh, so I can see the world different Uh, change my ears uh, so I can hear your voice differently Uh, change my mouth uh, so I can speak into situations uh, with life and not death Uh, change my feet uh, so I can walk where you tell me to go Uh, change my hands uh, so I can touch folk uh, and love them into the kingdom of God Uh, but whatever you do God uh, recalibrate me interrupt me set me on the right road somebody shout hallelujah divine interruptions recalibrate you and I so we are aligned 
with the ways of Jesus. It does not assume that what you are doing today is fully aligned with what God seeks for you to fulfill. If you're like me, I welcome divine interruptions. How do those divine interruptions happen? Most of the time they happen in prayer. More recently, they happened in my therapy sessions. I thank God for godly therapists and counselors. Who can help make sense of all the mumbo jumbo? Sometimes they happen in my small groups, conversations with other godly folk. But when I seek the face of God intentionally, divine interruptions are much more or much less disruptive. They're more frequent and less disruptive. Now, there's sometimes where God just be like, all right, it's time for me to take a big step. And I'm okay with those big disruptions. Saul, after his divine interruption, literally, the scripture says that he became blind, he could not speak. And for three days, he did not eat or drink. That's a divine interruption. That's an attention getting interruption my prayer to God is God don't let me get so far out that my interruption has to be that jarring but help me say yes to your will help me to say yes to your way help me to say yes God I'll go I'll do whatever you say come on stand to your feet